you can stand with me. I, I know in Pentecost we do this uh, up, down, up, down routine. So if you can stand with me, I'm going to read to you. Our ushers are going to come forth um, whenever they're ready. They can go ahead and come forth. I didn't forget y'all, so I'm doing something right today. Um, sometimes they go off out of town and I mess it all up. So I'm, I'm doing my best today. But um, we're going to read from Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16 as our ushers go ahead and come forth come forth. I sound like I'm a King James Bible up here. Um, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. You've all heard this before. It's, it's good stuff. You've probably said it to your kids a few times. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. I don't know if you've seen, or just kind of looked around the world or go to Walmart. We need happiness. We need joy. We need joy. And this is the path to it. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. We also need pleasant words, and no more negative things. We hear a lot of that. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There are a lot of avenues and paths that we can take in this life that look good and that seem right, but the end of those things can be death. That's a warning. Anytime we hear something like that in the Bible, that's, there's a warning there that's being uh, you know, put out for us to look at, and to, to stop and to take a moment and say, okay, all this talk about pride, and I see that it leads to a path that leads to death. So I want to focus a little bit today on what is a sure sign of a wise person, and that is humility. Humility. This is the first of many steps to, to getting on the path of wisdom and choosing life and choosing happiness and choosing joy. But it starts with a little bit of humility. It starts with just looking in the mirror and saying, what, what, what can I do to, to, to grow, to get better, to get closer to God? Where is the error in my ways? Let me just take the plank out of my eye before I, I, I you know, pick on somebody else. And so I want to focus in today on the hope of the helpless, the hope of the helpless. And, uh, and I believe that, that we do have a great hope this morning in God. I believe that we have hope no matter what the world looks like around us, no matter how helpless you may feel in this world, there is hope. There's hope. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell the difference between wisdom and pride. Okay, this path sums that up. The, there's a way that seems right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So if you've lived long enough, you've probably made a decision that you thought was right, but that you found out later was foolish. Anybody here made a bad investment, um, made a, uh, you know, bad decision? Maybe you said something you shouldn't have said, something you regret. You know, maybe you went to a timeshare presentation. You've made bad decisions um, <laughs> at some point in your life. You thought it was a good decision, but it was a bad decision. They told you you'd get a $100 credit card, but you didn't know they were going to lock you in a prison cell. Timeshare presentation, just giving you a warning. I haven't fell for that one yet. My parents did, so they prepared me for that one. Um, so a bad decision, something that you regret. But I want to go a little further. Has anyone ever felt helpless? Helpless, I mean utterly helpless. There, I, I don't know what to do. I am helpless. I, I feel totally helpless. And I, I want to challenge you today to think about that when you are helpless, when you are out of options yourself, that is where you can truly become dependent on Christ alone. It's when I have no other options, when I don't have a choice but to take my hands off of it, that now I have to depend on him. And there's something powerful about that. There's something powerful about being helpless in a sense because now my faith all rests on him. The pressure's off. My faith rests in God. And so now I get to put it all in his hands and just trust him with it. I don't have any control over the outcome, but he does. And so I give it over to him and I trust in him. 
I have felt helpless before. I got on a roller coaster at least one time. And I regretted it when I got to the top and I realized I was 200 feet off the ground or however much it was. I felt helpless. And they told me, it's going to be fun. It's going to be, you're going to love it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And don't be scared. Uh, keep in mind, I was all 24 years old the first time I got on one. So don't be, you can do it, buddy. You got this. They had to talk to me like I'm a child. Come on, little guy. So they, I get in the, you know, roller coaster. We get up to the top. I'm strapped. There's no going back. And I realized what I had done. And I felt helpless. I'm usually about five feet off the ground. And now I'm 200 feet off the ground. And I'm strapped in. And I see these little buildings and these little people at the bottom. And I knew uh, this was it. You know, I had made a terrible decision. I felt helpless. They always said, you're going to want to ride it again. After you ride it once, you're just going to ride it over and over again. I've never rode that ride ever again. We went back uh, for our honeymoon, and my wife rode the ride with a a 10-year-old boy sitting beside her, and he had a blast. I'm not riding it again. I'm done. That was it. I I had my fun. But I felt helpless in that moment. And when you're helpless and you're not in control, you just have to close your eyes and hold on. It's a scary feeling. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that in life where you're just like, I, I got to hold on for, I don't know what's coming, but I got to hold on because I'm here now. This is what life has dealt me. And I, I just want you to know that the first thing we need to do is understand that we are all a bit helpless in a sense. We're a bit helpless in a sense. Now, you might feel like you have control of your health, wealth, your 401k, and, and that's good. That's good. Those things are all good, and we try our best. I'm not telling you today uh, to throw all caution to the wind and just hold on and expect God to just drop miracles off at your doorstep, and now you don't need to work anymore or eat. Or That's not what I'm telling you. But what I am saying is we can control some things, but there are always going to be things that are out of our control, right? We are spin- If you just stop for a moment and think about this, we are spinning around the sun on this small rock in the middle of this vast universe and our heart is pumping blood, and, that, and, and we need that to survive and to make the next breath. And when you start looking at our life, you go, wow, it's crazy that I have another breath today. It's actually amazing that I'm still here. And, and so we start to think of those things. And this last year with, with a pandemic sweeping, uh, sweeping over our, our nation, you saw what happens when people feel like they're losing control. Everybody went crazy, you know, and, and I don't say that. I did, we did, I, I didn't know what to do. I had never been put in that position. I, we were put in a position where we've got to make decisions where you start to think about, is my health in jeopardy if I go to the grocery store? And you realize you don't have control anymore. Only God does. God has control. Now, there are things that we can do to help and manage and do things in our life, but really at the end of all things, every day, is that every time I get behind the wheel of my car, I'm risking my life. I don't have that much control. And I say all that to say this, that if you're looking around and you're looking at my generation or maybe younger generations, you might be shaking your head and thinking, what is wrong with these guys? All right, what, what is going on? Why has the new generation lost their minds? Can I tell you something? There's an old proverb that there's nothing new under the sun. That there are crazy ideas that didn't just start with this young generation. That we've inherited some things that were there long before we got here. And I, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, there was a philosophy that hit academia and hit a college campus. And it's, it's a real fancy word called existentialism. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a philosophy. I love this stuff, and I would put everybody to sleep if I started going down the history of existentialism this morning. But there was a philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre, and he said, existence precedes our essence. Wow, real fancy word for we exist, and we are born in Ball, Louisiana, or wherever you come from. And so because of where you're born, who your parents are, where you're located, that creates your essence. You don't really have a lot of control over that. You're just here spinning on the rock. You live, you retire, you have kids, you retire, you die. Those kids do that, and they're on this merry-go-round of life, and so all life is meaningless. This is a philosophy that started a long time ago. And when you see some of the things going on in the culture, it's because of these ideas that were started on the college campus even 200, 300 years ago. 
all life is meaningless. Life is a cycle. It's a merry-go-round. And when you get a glimpse of life from this perspective, it's scary. It's scary to think that maybe, what, what, if, what if life is meaningless? What if God didn't exist? What if life is meaningless? What if I just work a job and die and that's it? And that's what's going on. And this, uh, you know, puts us in a place where you, you want to get off this roller coaster ride when you see it for what it is. And you go, wow, this is all life is? It, it makes you think, I'm not in that much control. There's a theologian that said, only he who is helpless can truly pray. Think about that. I want to say that again. Only he who is helpless can truly pray. On that roller coaster ride, I learned to pray. I got close to Jesus. I started praying, repenting. For, God, forgive me. There's something about when we're desperate, when we're helpless, that causes us to truly look at our life and have a conversation with God. I don't know if you've had an intense prayer meeting with God. I know I have a praying mom. I know what intense prayer looks like. I know what it sounds like. I've grown up around it. But there's something about someone who's desperate for God to speak to them. There's, some, there's something about someone who's desperate to be in the presence of God. There's a prayer. There's a different kind of prayer. There's a different kind of worship that comes when we are just desperate to be around him, to just feel his presence, to just know he's right there with us in the middle of this. It's a different kind of worship. We need the one who orchestrated every star in the galaxy to orchestrate each step that we take. We need him. We are helpless at times, and that's when we become wholly dependent on God. So helplessness, again, means you just get to take your hands off of it. John 15, verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without him, I'm nothing. Without him... The atheistic existentialist philosopher is right. Yeah, my life's meaningless. Without him, I am nothing. But with him, but with him, everything's possible. But with him, with the one who orchestrated all of this, everything is possible. And I want to tell you today that he knows you, and he knows where you're at, and your life is not meaningless, and it's not empty, and you're not just stuck out here by yourself trying to navigate the world. He hears your prayer. He hears your call. He knows your voice. He knows every thought. We serve a God who knows us and loves us. Solomon, he looked at every alternative he, to, to God. He, 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 he had the most wealth. He had, he had money, women, a mansion, everything you could have of material. And he said, meaningless. It's a different translation. One says vanity. All is vanity. Meaningless. Meaningless. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Shakespeare's Macbeth said, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. And it's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Let me tell you, you want to know emptiness, you want to know misery, you want to know why our world is crippling with depression and anxiety. When you remove God, you have absolutely nothing left. We are nothing without him. Jesus said that. He said, without me. Trust me, without, the, the, without me, you are nothing. It's the cry of the world today. G.K. Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Why don't you think about that for a second? If you're looking at the world and you're going, what, why are people so, so just bought into all these crazy ideas and ideologies? When people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. See, what's happened is whenever we take up the cornerstone of truth, goodness, beauty, morality, when we've taken that up and thrown that away, we are left with just our opinions and our preferences. And when I'm God, it doesn't look too good. When I've removed the God out of the equation, I am saying I am God. And when I'm God, it's not pretty. It's not pretty when I become God. So I'll say again, if you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders... Maybe you've already just taken the mask of pride off and said, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not God. But he is. He knows me. He hears my prayer. He hears my voice today. And what I've got to do is cry out to him.
And when I do that and he meets me, there's nothing like that. You want to know joy? You want to know peace? You want to know happiness? It's whenever you're in communion and in fellowship with your creator, with the one who breathed life into you. That's happiness. That's success. And it cannot start with pride. It has to start with saying, I can't do this alone. Now, Solomon ended Ecclesiastes by saying this. Now, all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of all the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. He said, just fear God and keep his commandments. That's it. You want to know happiness? You want to know peace? Fear God and keep his commandments. Walk with God and you will know joy and peace and happiness. Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote, to believe in a God means to see the facts of this world are not the end of the matter. To believe in God means to see that life has a meaning, that this meaning does not lie in it but outside of it, that I will never feel the void in my life by getting more stuff in this one. But once I realize that this life is bigger than me and that there's a creator that's outside of all this that actually sees me inside of all this and knows where I'm at, that's when my life can take on meaning and significance the solution to our brokenness is not found in another self-help book, another seminar, another financial blessing, and I'm for all those things. No, the solution is bigger than this world. It's bigger than the things that we can see. And I know I'm preaching to the choir today because everybody in the room is here. You're here on Sunday. You're, hey, I'm with you, man. I, I'm here. I believe in this stuff. I believe in this. I know this. And, and I'm glad that you're here today. But I want to remind you that we have to be in communion with this God that we serve. I know that there are times in my own personal life where I've been here, but I'm not really here. I'm not really, I'm not really bringing myself here. I'm not coming to God with everything. I'm not speaking to him and knowing that he's listening and, and coming to him just as I am and laying it out on the table. See, that's, that's prayer. It's really bringing, it's being real with God. It, it's, bring, it's bringing everything to him and saying, you know what, God, I, I, I'm here today, and, and I know that you hear me, and I want to give you everything today. If knowledge and, and wisdom are the beginning of sorrow as we recognize our broken condition, prayer is the beginning of joy as we recognize that we're important to our creator. That's the beginning of joy. In John 16, Jesus answered them and said, Do you now believe? These things I've spoken unto you that in time you may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want the one who's overcome this world to be on my side. I want to be in communion with the one who's already overcome this world that we live in. So let's talk about joy for a moment. The beginning of joy is in prayer. It's found in prayer. John 16 Verse 23 says, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. I mean, do you still believe in prayer this morning? Do you believe that whenever you ask things in his name, whenever you trust that he can hear your prayer, that he's going to answer? I hope we haven't abandoned that yet. I hope we haven't got so beat down by this negative world that we actually believe that the God who created all time, space, matter cannot hear our prayer and respond to that. I hope that we haven't reduced God because the rest of the world has. I want to know that whenever I'm praying to him, I believe that he hears my prayer. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Why is our world joyless? Because without prayer, without communion with God, without conversations with God, you can't have joy. It's a biblical principle that when we go to him in prayer, he's going to meet us with joy. You want peace of mind in the middle of a storm? Pray. Pray. You, you want happiness and peace and joy and long suffering? Pray. 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 Spend time in prayer. Talk to your God. Talk to your creator. That's where joy comes from. That's where it's found. But there's a step we take when we realize we're helpless. It's another step to realize who's helpful. To recognize who he is. I'm helpless in so much as I try to do this by myself. But with, that, with, with him, I'm not so helpless anymore. Prayer is not much about the words that you say as it is about recognizing he's God. We're human. Going to him and recognizing him. John 4, Jesus approaches the woman at the well. And you've heard this story before. She's been through several marriages. And she's coming for another drink of, of water from the well. 
Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. I love that. He says, If only you knew what this is really about. If only you knew. Because we get so blinded by this world and by our perspective. She's going for a drink of water. She doesn't realize that the fountain of living water is standing right in front of her. That everything she could ever ask or need is standing right there. And so he says, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Our, our, our perspective has to shift to, God, what, what, can, what can I get? I, I, I want to be in communion with you. I want to see you. I want the water that you have. John Piper put it this way. A prayerless Christian is like a bus driver trying alone to push his bus out of a rut because he doesn't know Clark Kent is on board. Imagine Clark Kent's on board of the, of the bus, and we're trying to push it and move it, and all we need to do is ask him. And our God is so much bigger than a comic book hero. Our God is so much more powerful than anything that we could even imagine. And we won't just ask, God, I need you to move in this situation. I know you can. Because we've just gotten so bombarded by doubt and cynicism and skepticism in the real world that we don't think God can. And I'm here to tell you, he can. It's a recognition in the middle of a valley that God has you. First Peter chapter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. He loves you. He knows you. He's looking for you. He hears your cry. He hears your voice, and he responds to you. Trust me, the God who created all of this and millions of prayers are going before him every day, here's your prayer. Here's your cry. He knows you. And it's through prayer that we find this joy, that we get through these trials. John Piper also pointed out the difference between Christ and Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam only enlists the healthy, but Christ will only enlist the sick. I'll say that again. Uncle Sam would only enlist the healthy, but Christ will only enlist the sick. He only wants the broken. He only wants the humble. That's all he wants from us. He wants us to come to him broken. That's a prerequisite for him. He doesn't want perfect. He doesn't, re he's perfect. We're not perfect. We come to him with our flaws. We come to him with our problems. We come to him with our issues. That's what he's asking for. He's saying for you to come to him with that brokenness. In Mark chapter 2, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's looking for the broken. He's looking for the imperfect today. Two primary functions of prayer are God's glory and our joy. John 14 says, whatever you ask in my name that I will do. Why? Because the Father may be glorified in the Son. Because whenever I get glory, that's what matters. We see miracles for his glory. Not to say, well, look what I did. But it's because when you were helpless and you knew you couldn't do anything, he did something. And so he gets the glory because nobody else could have done it. It's only him who could have saved me. Hitherto, in John 16, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask you shall receive that your joy may be full. Prayer is how we find joy. Living without prayer means robbing God of his glory and robbing yourself of joy. And I know there are people in the room who have prayed for years and you feel like, oh, I don't know if God's going to answer this prayer. But when you go to him in faith, even after you've sought the answer and you haven't received it, you're still glorifying him. You're giving him glory in that process. But in return, expect peace of mind. Expect joy. He hears your prayer. John 16 says, Verily I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and, sh and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. I want joy. I look at the story of Abraham in the book of Genesis. He's 100 years old. His wife is 90 years old. And they have prayed for a child. And God hasn't given them that blessing. And they've prayed for decades for a child. And one day God says, I'm going to give you a child. And he's 100 years old. And naturally, Abraham starts laughing. 
because he looks at himself in the mirror and says, I, I don't know how this is going to happen. We're 100 years old, God. I mean, we trust you. We believe. But it's not just that. He was overcome by joy because God had broke through in a situation that he had prayed for and prayed for and prayed for. I don't know if I can blame him. He was overjoyed when God broke through. Prayer is where God breaks through in our situation. And then there's something that I want to go a little further. There's fervent prayer. There's fervent prayer. There are plenty of theologians and scholars that would debate on how you should pray. Should you stand up? Should you sit down? Should you yell? Should you pray in a whisper? How should you pray? And I'm not here to answer all the questions, but I'll tell you this. Prayer works. That's what I know. That's what I know. I know prayer works. That's all I know. I got a couple of liberal arts degrees that mean absolutely nothing, okay? I've got a master's degree in college, and I can barely change a light bulb. So I'm not the, the arbiter of common sense. I can tell you a lot about Plato and Socrates if you want to know about something like that. But when it comes to, like, fixing a car or something, don't, don't call me, okay? I don't, I'm one of those. It's really good for a lot of nothing. But the common sense that I do have is that prayer works. I've just seen it work. I, I've just seen it work time and time again in my life, in the lives of my family, in this church. I've just seen prayer work over and over and over again. And when you see something works, you know, naturally I want to figure out how it works. I can't tell you everything about how it works. I just know that it works. I just know that prayer works. I've just seen it in action. I have seen it work. Again, I grew up with a praying mama. If you grew up with a praying mama, you probably know what that felt like to hear her praying in the middle of the night. If you grew up and your mom was a prayer warrior, you might wake up in the middle of the night with her by your bed, speaking in tongues and travailing over you. Okay, that's a little scary to wake up in the middle of the night with your praying mama at the bedside. That'll wake you up. That'll get you to stop doing whatever you're doing. God, I'm sorry. I get my mom out of here and I'll quit. I'll stop. Growing up with a praying mom, you just knew and there were things that she knew that you don't know how she knows. God told her stuff. She would know what you were up to before, before you would even confess anything. But God had spoken to that praying mama. I don't know how it works. I just know it works. And I attribute, I don't know how I'm here today, but 99.9% .9 of the reason I'm here is because of a praying mom. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one with a praying mom in the room, but I just know prayer works. I've seen it work. I've seen it work. I've seen what happens when we petition God. Do you still believe that prayer works in the here and now? Do you still believe that prayer is effective? That when you go to this God, that prayer works? That prayer, there's power in prayer. Moses petitioned God to spare Israel, and he kept on and kept on. And God responded. I, I, I don't understand how it all works again, but I know that it does. There's a parable in Luke 18. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to the sin that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was a city, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came to him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And here's a translation of that in the Message Bible. He never gave her the time of day, but after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, even less what people think, but because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to be beaten up black and blue by her pounding. A passionate mom, a passionate prayer warrior, a passionate father that just says, I'm going to keep going. I don't, I don't know the answer, but God hasn't said no yet, so I'm going to keep praying and see if he says yes. I'm going to keep going to him. I'm going to keep bringing. There are people who actually believe that once you've prayed something, to God one time that you don't need to go back because he already heard it. One, I, I'm not a believer in that theology. I believe that, that, that he te teaches clearly to keep going, to pray without ceasing, to keep petitioning me. Unless God has said no and slammed the door on something, keep praying. Keep seeking after him because at the very least, you're in communion with him. You are, you are venting to him what's going on in your life. You're in relationship with him. Keep going to him with this. 
keep bringing it to him. I see example after example of those who petitioned God and prayed over and over and over for something to happen, and then it happened. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give up. The power of the helpless is our reliance on God with things we can't control. But it's a very prideful thing to say, I don't have time for prayer. It's, it really is at the heart of it. And I've been there. Oh, God, I got stuff to do today. I don't have time for that. But what a prideful thing to say. What we're saying is, I got this. I have control. I don't need you to, to, to help me today. I've got this by myself. You just, you just sit here, and I'm going to go take care of this myself. I got this. What a prideful thing to say. One person put it this way. The basic human problem is that everyone believes there's a God, and I am it. That's a problem. That's what's wrong with our world today. I don't need God. I am God. One writer put it this way. Why do more people commit suicide in San Francisco, the most beautiful city in America, than in other cities? Why is it that a man riding a, a train from Larchmont to New York whose needs are dr and drives are satisfied, who has a good home, loving wife and family, good job, who enjoys unprecedented cultural and recreational activities, often feels bad without knowing why? Why is it that we can have all the things we want in this life and still be miserable? Because if you're not in communion with your creator, you will never have joy, you will never have peace, you will always be missing something in your life. And maybe if God answered every one of our prayers like we think he ought to or gave us the things that we think he, he should and the timing that we think he should, we wouldn't witness the miracle that he's working on. And then maybe he's up to more than just giving us what we want when we want it because Isaiah 55 and 8 says, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I wonder if we could just be at peace with that. And just say, you know what, God, I know you got this. I'm going to keep coming to you because I want to be in relationship with you. I want I, I want to walk with you. I want to know you. And I know that you will work this out in your timing. But I'm going to come to you today. I'm going to pray today. I'm going to petition you today. I'm going to ask for you to, to reach me in my brokenness today. And that's the hope of the helpless. My hope is that I'm completely and solely dependent on my creator. Could you stand with me? closing and I just I think it would be fair today if and I'm not going to tell you how to to approach God today and and you know exactly how you ought to pray or how you know but I will say this one prerequisite is just honesty and humility and coming to God and saying God here I am here's what I'm facing you know what you're going through if we went around this room you would be shocked to know that just about everybody in this room is facing a situation in which they don't have control. We are all facing something in which we don't really know what the next step is or what to do about it. But I just believe today, if we could spend just a little time, just a moment, seeking after Him, what a difference could it make if we just came to Him? I want to give you one more closing illustration. Eddie was a young Jewish girl. She kept a journal when she was in prison at the uh, infamous Nazi death camp called Auschwitz. And um, in the journal, she discussed what she called her uninterrupted dialogue with God. And she said this. She said, sometimes when I stand in the corner of the camp, my feet planted on your earth, my eyes raised towards your heaven, tears run down my face, tears of deep emotion and gratitude. I want to remind you, she's in a, a death camp. She says, sometimes when I just look up, I, I just feel gratitude. And I want, I want to be there right in the thick of what people call horror and still be able to say life is beautiful. Yes, I lie here in a corner, parched and dizzy and feverish and unable to do a thing. Yet I am also with the jasmine and the peace of sky beyond my window. For once you've begun to walk with God, for once you've begun to walk with God, you need only keep walking with God, and all of life becomes one long stroll, a marvelous feeling. Now, how this young lady stood in the middle of a concentration camp and looked her eyes up to the heavens as tears rolled down her face and gave gratitude to God, I'm not sure I totally understand. 
But what scares me is that I can be here in my comfort zone in North America where I'm not in that situation. And I can say, I don't have time for prayer today. I got lunch. I got to go get lunch. I don't have time for gratitude today. And maybe that's our problem is, is we don't really know brokenness the way that other people have who have fought the fight. But, but maybe we're so busy with other things or maybe we're mad at God and we're actually saying that, God, because you didn't give me what I wanted, I don't feel gratitude and I'm not going to worship you today because I didn't get it in my timing and I didn't get it the way I ought not to do. But yet someone in the middle of a, of a camp where they are murdering innocent men, women, and children before her eyes. She can stand there and when the tears roll down her face, she can say, God, I am so grateful. I am so grateful. I'm sorry, but here in North America, we have the freedom to gather in this room today and just worship an awesome God, and I don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to pass up a moment or an opportunity to stand here and say, God, I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for what you've done for me. God, I don't know how you're going to work everything out right now, but I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that you see me, that you hear me. If someone in a concentration camp can pray and be grateful, I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to come before the throne. I'm just not going to do that. I want to come before the throne and cast all my cares on this God because it's not about me. It's always about him. It's always about his kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about us. How is it that we can have so many things and still be miserable and others can go through so much pain and suffering and still find gratitude and still find grace and still see God for who he really is? I don't want to wait until I have to go through something to realize just how great he is. I want right now, today, in this moment, before we get out of here, I want to take a moment and recognize just who he is. Can we do that together? Can we do that together? Can we come forward together and just pray for a moment? Can we pray for our nation together? Can we petition God for our needs together? Can we worship him together for just a moment? I wonder what would happen if we just came to him with everything today. If we just looked at him with everything we've got and said, God, I just want a moment with you. I'm not, I'm not going to pass by a moment or an opportunity to spend some time in your presence today. God, you've been so good to me. You've been so faithful. You've been so, so, so good. And so I'm not going to pass by this opportunity or this moment to worship you. I'm not going to pass by this opportunity to petition you with my needs and go before the throne and spend a little time in conversation with you. Could we just have an honest conversation with God this morning? I wonder if there's some prayer warriors here. I wonder if there's someone who has, who has petitioned God before here that can, can, can begin to just call on his name and seek him out. I wonder if we could just bring our needs to him fervently today, if we could just seek after him today for just a moment. Is there someone here who's in a broken state, who needs God to move, who needs God to intervene? Is there someone here who's been praying for a need and you're just asking God to move today? And I'm believing that if we risk, lift our voices and our hands to you today, that you're going to move in this place. Your spirit is going to move in this place, God. I believe you're going to answer prayers today. I still believe in the power of prayer. I still believe that when we petition you with our needs, you answer, God. We're standing before you today in faith believing that you can do all things, that you can do anything. Let's pray for a moment.